Hi there, welcome to the new video. Today we'll be going through this paper which is titled as Beyond Accuracy, Behavioral Testing of NLP Models with Checklist. This is from researchers from Microsoft, University of Washington and University of California, Irvine. And also this paper won the ACL 2020 Best Paper Award. So yeah, in a very nutshell this paper essentially introduces a new framework for evaluating the NLP models beyond certain automatic evaluation matrix such as accuracy. So let's start with the abstract. Although measuring held out accuracy has been a primary approach to evaluate generalization, it often overestimates the performance of the NLP models. So yeah, this is pretty true because most of the times the test split that you make from your entire data might not be representative of the entire distribution. It will certainly lack on certain nuances and will highly depend on the process in which the data was collected. Also, if you talk about training data, which is relatively larger in size compared to test data, so it's very likely that the model will learn certain task-specific shortcuts to perform well on the test data. Instead of learning some low level fundamental language properties that might be useful for the downstream task. So that way we kind of overestimate the performance if we get the numbers let's say 96% should we directly go about and trust that model? I certainly doubt that because most of the times you'll see these models failing on very basic sentences even if they were trained on like millions of sentences. And this paper talks exactly that. We'll see as we go forward in this paper when the authors test out the commercial as well as the research state-of-the-art methods for various tasks such as sentiment analysis, question answering, and so on. Let's read further. We introduced Checklist, a task-agnostic methodology for testing NLP models. So it's a matrix of general linguistic capabilities and test types to facilitate comprehensive tests. Okay, so they're introducing a matrix where the rows are nothing but the linguistic capabilities which again depends on the developers who are trying to test their models out. So it could be, let's say, testing negations, testing robustness by inserting typos and all those things, then testing on named entity switchings, and so on and so forth. Whereas for the y-axis, authors introduce three kind of test types. The first one is called invariance property, where if I make any change in the text, should I expect the model to change its class label? The next one is directionality which means let's say for the case of sentiment analysis, if the original sentiment was negative and I add a small piece of text, which is also of negative sentiment, will the model be more confident for the negative sentiment or the score will move towards the positive? So in that way, you're kind of testing the direction in which the model's prediction tilt towards. And the last one being MFT, which stands for minimum functionality test, which is just like unit tests that you write for software programs. You'll have a bunch of examples and some ground truth and you want to check if your model performs good on those examples or not. So yeah, this is the entire matrix that the authors propose. And clearly you can see this is agnostic of the task type that you have in hand. It can easily work for translation, summarization, text classification. And not only that, I also believe this can easily be transported to the vision applications, such as what would happen if I add a random noise to each pixel? How robust is my model in terms of giving a correct classification? That way you can easily check the invariance property. And MFTs can easily be defined by giving some sample images based on different classes that you have. And the directionality, I believe, can be tested by doing certain augmentation for the images, which could be in the form of, let's say you have a cat and you add three more cats in that picture. Is the model still more confident in terms of saying it's cat? Or it got a little confused and reduced its prediction value from 0.8 to 0.5, let's say. So that way the model has kind of changed its direction. So definitely all of these tests can easily be defined for vision applications as well and similarly for speech applications. Okay, let's read further. So they release this checklist as a software tool that can be used to create test cases at scale and you need not be a linguist or the guy who has created that application. They use Roberta model to give auto suggestion fillers for the template that you choose to create certain example. And you have a little UI that you can run in Jupyter Notebook as well, which I guess is pretty convenient for the quality assurance team as well. They also did a user study where they sat with a Microsoft team that was responsible for making the sentiment analysis commercial API and the developers themselves found some actionable bugs even after the model has passed the stress testing phase. So yeah, that clearly shows the effectiveness of this method. So let's move forward and see in detail to what checklist exactly offers. So here they talk about the tests that we have already discussed which were minimum functionality test, invariance test, then directional expectation test. So as you can see in invariance, they apply label preserving perturbations to the input and expect the model predictions to remain the same. 
So this is all we have already discussed. So let's see some examples too when they tested the sentiment analysis API for the research as well as the commercial models. So as one of the linguistic test, they replace the neutral words with other neutral words. For example, they replace the word that with when, the with are. So in all of these cases, we don't expect the model to change its sentiments. That's why the original label should be preserved. But they found like the Microsoft API fails 9.4% of the times. Google even fails further with 16.2% of the times. Amazon's API with 12.4% and the research models Bird and Robert Tower hang in somewhere around 10.2%. Which is kind of shocking result for me because these are very basic replacements that the authors tried and even for that model from Google itself is failing like 86% of the times which means it just has an accuracy of something around 84%. Then they also try some directional properties. Let's say if you add a positive phrase and if the sentiment goes down by 0.1, then you say that the model has failed. So for example, if this was one of the sentences, Southwest Air Grid Trip 22672 yesterday, so already this was a positive sentiment. Now if you add further positive sentiment statement with that and you expect the sentiment to go up, in case the sentiment went down, they measure if the sentiment goes down by maximum of 0.1 of score. If that does so, then they say that the model has failed for this example. And you can clearly see like Amazon and Google are failing 12% of the times. Bird performs really good, like it's just 0.2% over here. Similarly, they try by adding negative phrase as well and see if the sentiment goes up by greater than 0.1. So this 0.1 is user defined threshold to how much tolerance you want to keep in. So let's say for this example, US Airways, your service sucks. This already is a negative sentiment statement. Now, if you add a sentence, which is, let's say you are lame, you have now two sentences of which both are of negative sentiment. So the overall sentiment has to be negative or it should be further negative. Now, supposedly your model says it to be not so negative compared to if it was earlier with more than 0.1 change in the score, then we'll say like the model has failed for this example as well. And it's really surprising to see like Google fails 34% of the times, which means for these kind of templates, Google performs just close to 66% of the accuracy for the sentiment classification task. Then they go about testing robustness where they add random URLs and usernames to the tweets. They do a swap of one character from the neighbor to introduce a typo. For example, here the thanks was changed to this. Then they added a random username in this tweet. They added a random URL in this tweet. So in all of these situations, the sentiment shouldn't change, right? Your model should be robust to ignoring non-essential things. But clearly in these situations as well, you can see Amazon to be failing 24% of the times, Google to be failing something around 10 to 12%. Research models are still better compared to the commercial models with the failure rate of around 5 to 3%. So this kind of gives a hint towards, I believe, that these models, which are trained really large amount of data, have somehow memorized something around the URLs, maybe something around the particular usernames. That's why there is a variance that's happening once you add some nonsensical stuff, model is not robust to that. Then they also tried switching named entities within a sentence. Let's say if you switch one location to some other location, if you change the name of a person from one to two, let's say Cuba to Canada, Sharon to Erin. So again, for all of these changes, the model should be robust enough in terms of not changing the original class. But again, sadly, they found like Google to be failing 20% of the times for such cases. And I mean, if you see the type of examples that we are kind of dealing with right now are really simple. These are not at all some adversarial examples which are handpicked and are made specifically to fail the model. These are some normal cases that can happen when your model is deployed in day-to-day -day situations. And even in those conditions, your model is failing with the average percentage of something around 10 to 15. Then they went ahead and tested the negations where they negated the negative sentiment word, which means now the overall sentiment should be either neutral or positive. For example, the food is not poor. So originally if the sentence was, if your food is poor and you have a not before this, which means you're not saying it's poor, which means it could be good or it's okayish. That's why positive and neutral. Google fails 54% of the times. I mean, this is eye opener for me at least. And it should be for you as well. Because I found many discussions saying NLP is cracked because now we have transformers and stuff. But clearly these results are not reflective of that. Similarly, if you negate a neutral word, then you should have a neutral sentiment such as this aircraft is not private. 
this is not an international flight. So all of these are like neutral sentiments, but still the commercial models and also the research models fail with more than 40% almost all the time. But now if you see like these results, the models are failing 100% of the time for Amazon and Google. So what they tested was they negated positive with neutral content in the middle. Let's see what does that mean? Sorry, I forgot what was the test. Negated positive with neutral content in the middle. Okay. So you have a neutral statement over here. This is a positive and you negate it. Okay. So if you have such template where you're saying something negative, a neutral, and then something positive, which means you're trying to say negative of that positive, which means the sentiment should be negative. And similarly for this case, in such situations, models are failing 100% of the times, which clearly I don't know what to say because surely this is little complicated example, but you don't expect the model to fail 100% of the times, right? That is it for sentiment analysis to what results they get when they evaluate the commercial models as well as the research based models. Then they also did a test for Quora question pair classification where it is said like the models are having superhuman performance, which kind of translates to saying your model is doing better than what an average person would have done for the task where it can identify given two questions, whether these two questions are duplicate or not. So for this, they didn't have any commercial API available. They just tested BERT and Roberta on that. So in this case as well, authors defined multiple linguistic properties, such as if you see the first one, if you add a modifier, the intent of the question changes. For example, is Mark Wright a photographer? And the second one being, is Mark Wright an accredited photographer? So both of these are not the same things, but BERT and Roberta fail 78% of the time for such statements in identifying the duplicates. Also in case if you have a synonym in a simple template such as how can I become more vocal and the second one is how can I become more outspoken both mean the same thing so these should be duplicates but failure rate of bird and robota is around 22 to 39 percent which is pretty huge for these simple sentences. So similarly you can go through like all of this list and you can see like the percentage of failure is like 100 percent, 35 percent, 69 percent, 100 percent which are like really alarming if you see the complexity of test cases that we're deriving, which are pretty simple. So in this case, they also tested the co-reference part. So very simple co-references such as he is not equal to she. There also the model kind of fails to know if a particular name is a he or she by 79 to 96% of the time. So yeah, that was about Quora question pair. Then they also tested for machine comprehension, which is question and answering. So for this, they just tested for BERT and you can see the numbers. You have 100%, you have 20%, you have 9% also. So there's a lot of variance in terms of failure rate based on the linguistic property that the authors test. So yeah, I think now we are done with the paper. Now they have experiments and evaluation. So yeah, I can see why this paper got selected as the best paper considering the impact this paper creates in the evaluation space is really phenomenal and if you see the idea is pretty simple it's not something out of the blue that nobody can think of but yeah this came to their mind so that's really good so clearly i wouldn't deny like we shouldn't use accuracy accuracy is useful on benchmarks but is clearly not sufficient while you evaluate your nlp models so frameworks like these are clearly going to help us in long run in improving our models as well and yeah it would be interesting to see like how many newer papers from next year use this metric as a part of their evaluation so yeah having said that if you like such content make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel also share it across with your friends to whosoever is interested share it across on the social media tag me over there i'll meet you in the next one bye